Okay, great. I think we're live now, so we can get started. Okay, welcome everyone for the uh, Safari live seminar series. Uh, this is our second one, and hopefully we will continue with more uh, during the summer. Uh, this time we have uh, a guest, uh, a veteran from industry, Andy Walker, who has more than 35 years of experience in industry in semiconductor industry, and he has done a lot of interesting work on 3D flash, uh, non-volatile memory technologies. And more recently, he's been looking into DRAM and scaling issues. Actually, he's been looking into that for a while, but he has written some papers on Rohammer and uh, DRAM scaling issues. Uh, so it's a pleasure to have him here. Andy received uh, his, PhD, his bachelor's degree from Scotland, Dundee University in Physics, and his PhD from TU Eindhoven working at Philips, and he's worked at Philips for quite some time before moving to the Silicon Valley and working at multiple companies in the Valley at Cypress, Matrix, and Spin Memory. And today uh, he's gonna share with us uh, his uh, research and thoughts on uh, mem main memory and storage technology scaling. Uh, and hopefully we will have a good discussion on important topics like this. So Andy, welcome. Uh, please go ahead. It's great okay, to have you. Thank you very much, Yonur. Yeah. So first of all, uh, 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 thank you to uh, Professor Mutlu and his team, the Safari uh, Research Team, for inviting me to, to give this talk. Uh, this is a, a, a sort of an extension of a talk I, give, I gave here in Silicon Valley a few months ago to the uh, Electron Device Society. And um, can you hear me OK? Uh, yes, it's perfect. Okay, so uh, I've, I've called this the addiction to low cost per memory bit, but at what cost, right? Uh, and I bring in things like negative externalities, you know, about uh, uh, costs to third parties uh, and so on. And it's, it's basically looking at the uh, uh, SRAM, DRAM and NAND space, and also mentioning emerging memories and the challenges they uh, face in becoming uh, mainstream. Um, so uh, the contents of the of the talk oh, there. So uh, I first of all want to digress in the first few slides and talk about the uh, the field effect transistor. Um, so I pay homage to that device uh, because it's been in my uh, uh, academic and professional experience now for almost 40 years, and I still find it an amazing, uh, an amazing effect. Um, I also then talk about tunneling. Um, tunneling in Silicon Valley, I, I visited the, uh, 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 a local uh, museum here, the Computer History Museum, where they have a lot of the, uh, the old notebooks of uh, some of the key researchers from the, the 1960s. So I'll show you some of that and then go through the golden thread of tunneling. So quantum tunneling, how does it come into play? How long has it been around? Uh, uh, and it plays such an important role in specifically NAND flash. So I wanted to set the scene with uh, uh, something on that. And it's also a bit of a, a, a stroll down memory lane because uh, uh, I've, I've been in this if I look back, it seems such a, a short time, but it's been uh, it's been almost forty years with various uh, companies and uh, and institutions. Um, I talk about what's happening uh, right at this moment in solid state memories, SRAM, DRAM, NAND, and emerging memories. Uh, we talk about the creaking memory hierarchy and the rise of AI. Well, wh why is AI uh, uh, pushing? the limits of the in the use of these kinds of memories. Um, why, why does it introduce uh, costs, which have always been there, but are now uh, rising to the fore? Um, what is a negative externality? Uh, and I, uh, I give examples in relation to solid state memories. Uh, uh, product lifetimes, the endurance conundrum. Uh, talk about the acquisition cost and the total cost of using memory. Compute and security. Uh, DRAM row hammer. Now, this is a, an area I, I only entered uh, in the last two or three years, um, but uh, uh, I hope to have made some kind of impression in that area and uh, 
I look to the experts online to, to tell me if that is the case. But uh, DRAM low hammer is, is a, a classic uh, negative externality. Uh, energy use, the problem with memory. You know, the, uh, we, uh, designers talk about uh, power, uh, power dissipation, but power dissipation is the instantaneous conversion of useful energy into heat. Uh, so it's the total uh, integral of power over time that is the problem nowadays. Why has it become uh, of uh, significant importance now? Uh, then a summary and then a prediction and a call to action to uh, those who are interested in making a difference in this area. And then uh, round off with a, a big thank you to all. So first of all, a homage to the field effect transistor. So when I started as a student in 1981 in, in Dundee University, uh, Dundee was, uh, the physics department was, uh, uh, was famous for being the first to produce a uh, field effect transistor in amorphous silicon. Um, the, they, had, uh, uh, they had found a technique uh, to make it uh, uh, useful, and it turned out to be uh, um, extremely important for, the, uh, for, for industry. Uh, and there were two people in particular, uh, Professor Speer and Lacomber. So they were my professors in solid state physics. So they, they, they introduced me to the field effect. So if you look at the history of the field effect, you go back to uh, the 1930s, uh, Julius Lilienfeld. Um, he was, he, he's from Lvov or Lviv in, uh, in what is now Ukraine, but at that time was part of the Austro-Hungarian empire. He uh, immigrated to the United States and he came up with this, this idea for, for uh, method and apparatus for controlled electric currents. Now he didn't, tend to write any uh, articles in, in, in journals or anything like that. So this remained as a, as a pattern. And this caused significant issues for William Shockley in the 1950s when he tried to uh, patent uh, the idea of the field effect transistor. Um, then in the 1960s, the early 60s, uh, the idea of the, the uh, uh, um, electric field controlled semiconductor device came about in, in, uh, in, in silicon and germanium. And silicon took off because of its ability to make a, a, a very good uh, thermal oxide. Um, so Kang and Atala were the key people there. And from there, that, that invention then led to all sorts of uh, interesting um, uh, devices and processes and so on for, the, for, the, for up until now. So if you look at SRAM, SRAM cell is six field effect transistors. The DRAM uh, cell is one field effect transistor with a capacitor. NAND is field effect transistors in a string, uh, all connected source to drain. Um, uh, so it's basically the foundation for this is the field effect and the field effect transistor. So we pay homage to these people who came up, who came up with these, uh, these concepts. Um, but notice with NAN, there's also the other concept of, of tunneling, quantum tunneling. Now, I gave a talk on that uh, a while ago at the, uh, the Flash Memory Summit because I got really interested in the physics of that. And that was also 1981. I can remember sitting in a, in a, a physics uh, uh, class and uh, uh, we were uh, introduced to the concept. And I thought, uh, I wonder what use this has, right? Little did I know that it would form the foundation for the next 30 to 40 years of a career. So it is a very, very interesting effect. And I want to talk about that a bit as well. So um, I got so interested, I like the history of technology. So I got interested in um, uh, what was done in Silicon Valley in the 1960s, specifically in, in the com Fairchild Company. And I visited the, uh, the Computer History Museum archives here and found the, the notebooks of Martin Lenslinger. So you might be in, uh, interested to know that Lenslinger and Snow were uh, uh, foundational in the, uh, the, uh, the ability to use quantum tunneling in a silicon device, specifically for non-volatile memories. So if you look uh, here, here's, oh, let me bring up the, uh, the laser pointer. This is a page from, his, one of his notebooks from 1967 or 60, yeah, November 67, uh, showing a plot of the, the uh, uh, basically the, the Fowler-Nordheim plot. 
And then he wrote a memo and he, he sent it to various people. And some of these people be, uh, were, at, at, were obviously at Fairchild at the time, but you can see Gordon Moore, you can see uh, uh, Andy Grove, uh, Les Vadas, um, some famous names. This is a few months before the, 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 some of those key guys went off to form Intel. So this is, uh, he makes this conclusion. The current through the oxide is limited by the tunneling injection. So this little did he know at the time that this would form the foundation of a whole industry. So then we look at the golden thread of tunneling. We go back to the fundamental physics in 1928. We look at uh, Paolo Nordheim. So uh, uh, coming up with the, the mechanism for uh, quantum tunneling, uh, uh, emission from a metal, electron emission from a metal. Uh, then we go through the MOSFET. The Kang and Atulla, the invention of the of the of the MOSFET in 1960, the combination of the MOSFET uh, with Simon C uh, to build the floating gate device, and then we go to Charles Trapp, uh, also 67, 68. Actually, it goes back to 66. Um, Wegener, uh, Keshevan, and Lin coming up with MNOS devices and MONOS devices which also formed the foundation of most of NAND flash, except for the, one, the ones based on floating gate. Um, Lenslinger and Snow coming up with uh, the physics of, the, of this uh, mechanism, which is based on Fowler Nordheim. Um, and then Froman Benchowski and Lenslinger, that name again, coming up with charge transport and storage in an MNOS transistor, all again based on charge storage in a, in a, in a field effect device. Um, then we have Harari with the E-squared PROM, Eli Harari in 1978. He's still active in, the, in Silicon Valley with a new company looking at uh, 3D, a form of 3D memory. Um, uh, and then um, uh, Momodomi, uh, a new flash, oh, sorry, uh, Masuoka, a new flash E-squared PROM cell using triple polysilicon technology, 1984. Um, and then we look at NAND flash, the invention of NAND flash, around about 1987, 1988. So this is, uh, uh, I remember this paper uh, when it came out, Momodomi and, uh, and so on, and Masuoka, you see him there. Um, and then we go to multi-bit, the ability to store more than one bit electrically in a single cell to increase the, the effective capacity, increase the, the density. Eli Harari at SanDisk. Then we talk about system flash, how to, how to control, uh, how to uh, uh, um, you know, uh, improve the, the, the concept, work with the fundamental limitations of, of the device uh, and uh, work with defective cells, how to do that in a system flash approach. So 1994, this extremely uh, uh, foundational for, for NAND flash. Then 2016, limits of 2D NAND flash. So two, 2D NAND flash then basically took off um, and uh, went all the way to sub 15 nanometer uh, half pitch. And uh, then something else was needed. And what was that something else? People started looking at monolithic 3D stacking of devices. So we're looking at things like um, thin film transistors, a combination of thin film transistors with charged storage. Again, uh, field effect transistors, but now built with polysilicon as the channel, not monocrystalline silicon. So fundamental shift. So I, I, I was fortunate enough to, to be able to join Matrix Semiconductor and we produced that paper in, in 2003. Then Macronix did uh, some excellent work and produced the first paper on thin film transistor NAND. So this is also foundational. Seems like yesterday, but you see what's happened since. Then there were certain uh, uh, challenges associated with such an approach. NAND provides certain challenges which need to be solved and need to be managed. One was uh, uh, disturbed. So I came up, I started a company and came up, the Skiltron Corporation came up with a, a dual gate thin film transistor Sonos device where you could store charge on one side of the channel, but pass current on the other side of the channel. So ideal for a, a NAND type string, a contactless type string. And then um, Bitcoin Scalable came up. 
uh, Toshiba in 2007. And then, uh, not to be outdone, Samsung came up with their TCAT approach in 2009, uh, which forms the foundation of VNAND. So the two companies that, uh, uh, that drove the revolution towards vertical channel NAND. And here is, uh, for, you know, uh, here is a, a VNAND device analysis by Chipworks from a, a few years ago. But basically, you can see these uh, uh, vertical strings. Here's the, here's the FET, here's the field effect device. Here you get a, the silicon channel, uh, uh, nano-crystalline silicon channel. You get uh, a fancy uh, gate uh, dielectric stack built of various uh, dielectrics which are optimized to store charge and change the threshold voltage of the MOSFET. And then we have the gate built of nitride and tungsten. But again, it's the field effect, it's charge, start charge storage through a, a, a tunneling mechanism. So that's my homage to uh, the field effect device and to, to uh, quantum tunneling. They form the foundation and those who were involved uh, in the 1960s would, would never have known what this would, uh, would uh, reach, the pinnacle of, that, uh, uh, of, of those studies. Now, the reason I go through that is not just a, a, a stroll down memory lane. It's to, it's to emphasize that the technologies that we are dealing with now are built on uh, millions of man hours uh, and women hours of, of, uh, of work and uh, are the pinnacles of, uh, of uh, all that study. And it, therefore it is extremely difficult to dislodge something like that. Uh, but what is happening is that uh, problems are starting to uh, become obvious. Um, and obviously there are ways to manage those uh, problems and challenges but some are becoming insurmountable. So as an entrepreneur, uh, a challenge is, is a great opportunity. So there are opportunities to be had in solving these kinds of problems. So anyway, so now I wanna talk about SRAM. Um, SRAM, six transistor cells. Um, uh, what's happening with SRAM? So if you look on the left-hand side, you can see um, SRAM cell area on a log scale as a function of the CMOS technology node on a, on a log scale. So this device here, up here, is uh, when I entered, close to when I entered the industry. And you can see that the, the, the downscaling, the shrinking of the devices with planar, uh, planar CMOS. And then we go to FinFET architectures and we see a different uh, uh, shrinking approach. Um, and here's the, here's the problem. Uh, uh, being able to continuously shrink uh, aggressively the, the, the 6T SRAM cell has become a challenge. Now, we have to remember, obviously, though, that CMOS technology node, uh, up here, it was, I remember 30 odd years ago, it was, it was still um, contentious to say, oh, I, we have uh, a 0.7 micron process. What is 0.7 micron? Uh, what does it really mean? Is it a half pitch of the smallest pitch or is it uh, the smallest feature size in the, in the memory technology and so on? That argument has only exacerbated as we go down to these sub 10 nanometer technologies. What is the a 10 nanometer? What is a five nanometer? What is a three nanometer technology? Because when it comes to uh, area usage, it's the, the pitches that are important. Uh, when it comes to uh, um, uh, 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 um, the you know speed and and so on, it is the uh, it is the minimum feature size of the transistor. So be careful when we talk about technology node. It's not absolutely clear what that is meant to be. So, uh, but many people are are defining what that is, and uh, a lot of good work is being done. But anyway, the main thing to see is. The, the CMOS uh, uh, is becoming more difficult to shrink. Uh, and that is seen in the, in the area of the SRAM cell. Then we have something on the right-hand side, which is leakage. Um, and this is uh, as a function of year. This is the estimated leakage current at 50 degrees centigrade for various uh, capacities of on-chip SRAM. Okay, so 
we are rising in the, the amount of on-chip SRAM in processor architectures. And what do they do? We what, they, what they are essentially are uh, uh, um, uh, leakage, uh, uh, leakage devices. So we have, we have an energy barrier at the source of each device. Uh, electrons and holes will want to get over that barrier. As we make the device shorter and shorter and shorter, they find it more easily to get over that barrier. Uh, they, they find it easier to get over that barrier. So that is the that is a problem. So this is then a, a summary of of the ability of these carriers to get over the energy barrier at the source. And in addition, there are leakage mechanisms through dielectrics and so on that uh, also go into this. But these are fundamental mechanisms that need to be taken into account. Then we look at DRAM. What is happening with DRAM? So DRAM uh, scaling is slowing down, but uh, you know fundamentally we have reached a sub 15 nanometer node. Uh, in I think Micron has has just come out with that. So a sub 15 nanometer node in DRAM. Um, uh, but as you all know, there are issues with that that are disturb a disturbed mechanism associated with DRAM which is the, the, the row hammer effect. I'll go more into that uh, later, but uh, uh, Owner and his team have done fundamental work in that, along with groups from Microsoft and Google and so on. So here we have you know, the row hammer bit flip rates as a function of the number of times the hammer count of a, of a particular uh, word line. And you can see as the technology uh, it gets more aggressive. Newer technologies have bigger problems associated with them, right? So lots of interesting papers on that, obviously, uh, but that is a fundamental mechanism and we'll go more into that, the physics of that later on. What's happening in NAND? So the, the conversion, the transition to 3D NAND uh, was revolutionary, if you like, as, as revolutionary as you can imagine in, in a silicon technology. Um, because the active devices are now not in the bulk of the silicon uh, only, but they are in uh, a deposited layer uh, above the silicon. Now, uh, and that deposited layer is not monocrystalline. It is uh, nanocrystalline. So it mobility of carriers in that material is much lower than in, in the bulk. So we have to take that into account. So any, anyway, so what's happening? We're reaching diminishing returns from the cell string stacking. So it is getting extremely complex to, uh, to add more cells, more strings on top of the existing cells and strings. Why is that? One of them is the string current is a major challenge. It's basically a long resistor. So mobilities are low in that material in the channel. So, uh, but the only way to really in, increase capacity, increase density, is to stack more cells. So then the string current goes down. Um, and we call something called the, the worst case string current comes into play where one cell in the array state is, is being read while all the other cells in the string are in the program state and we have to read through them all. So new materials and epitaxial growth are needed. Uh, you know, trying to get to a crystalline material for the channel is key. Uh, now, this is in addition to all the uh, um, manufacturing challenges associated with making these structures. Um, but in the end, uh, the tools industries have done an amazing job in, in coming up with uh, you know, processes and tools to make these structures. Uh, but again, it's getting extremely challenging. Um, electrical bits per cell are basically exhausted. We're, and I mean, we've gone from single level cell multi-level, two, two bits per cell, triple level, quadruple level, uh, penta level, if you like, uh, uh, is being talked about at the expense of endurance and speed and, and latency, be, being able to get the data out on time. Uh, but that's, this thing about at the expense of endurance is an interesting one, which I'll go more into. Now, there are those who say, look, uh, what's the point of working on another kind of memory, an evo uh, um, an emerging memory that has high endurance. Uh, it will never take over NAND. And the people who say that are correct because uh, um, you have to have uh, 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 not only the endurance, but you also have, have to have the cost of building it, right, per, per bit. 
So uh, what will really take over now? That is a great conundrum, right? Um, and now the other thing which has already been done is the active circuitry which is now under the memory array that trick has been done already so you know to minimize the die size so what else can be done so basically uh nand is 3d nand is is a victim of its own success we've already uh, uh you know wrung out uh, the maximum we can uh from the technology what more can be done well the only thing that really can be done is stack more and that is a challenge for, for these reasons here. So what about emerging memories? So there is a ton of work on emerging memories, right? Endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful have been and are being evolved. That comes from the origin of species, Charles Darwin, 1859. So things like STTM RAM, uh, uh, RERAM, FERAM, uh, PCM, all the different types of uh, mechanisms being introduced and reintroduced actually um, you know as uh, contenders for uh, uh, for emerging memories um, they involve less well understood switching mechanisms con co compared to charge storage uh, new materials are are needed in many of them um, uh, one of the things that we ha they have to deal with is the highly conservative manufacturing culture as a barrier to entry but also something very very uh, useful to ask is uh, what specific problems in the memory hierarchy are actually being solved? So uh, whenever anybody comes up with, uh, uh, you know, an emerging memory as very interesting and you ask them what problem is being solved and there are legitimate problems to be solved, right? Do they solve these problems? Now, um, as an example of uh, the statement that there is nothing new under the sun, on the left-hand side, you can see, um, this is from, um, I think it's, uh, let's see, 1974, IEEE transactions on, on electron devices, a new ferroelectric memory device. So that field effect transistor with ferroelectric uh, material between the gate and the channel. So this is, um, it's been done before, but now we have access to newer types of materials, better uh, processing, uh, better controls and so on, right? So this is now being uh, uh, reworked and is, is, is making a comeback as it were, mostly because of, I think, uh, the introduction of hafnium oxide um, yeah, in, the, in standard CMOS, in advanced standard CMOS, and hafnium oxide has a, a ferroelectric capability. Um, and then we have uh, magnetic tunnel junctions, MTJs, in MRAM. Now, these are, uh, uh, these are magnetic materials separated by a tunnel barrier. So again, a quantum tunneling comes into play. And in this, this case, it's magnesium oxide. And the ability to tunnel through that is, 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 is dependent on uh, the relative magnetization vector directions of a reference layer and a free layer. And we can flip the free layer, free layer, and we can flip between two, uh, two resistance states. So that is emerging memory. So the key bit is what specific problems are being solved by them. Okay, now we talk about the, the creaking memory hierarchy and the rise of AI, okay? So we're all familiar with that pyramid on the right-hand side, right? SRAM, DRAM, main memory, DRAM, and NAND storage, all on separate chips, separate pieces of silicon. Um, and there is a, 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 you know, a, a speed and a capacity uh, pyramid that can be made, right? And there are gaps. There are gaps between uh, what is on the silicon in the computer, in the CPU chip. Uh, then we have a separate chip or chips for the DRAM, we have separate chips for the NAND, uh, and then we have disk and so on. We have non-volatile and we have volatile. Now, uh, the, this gap here, what is that? That is um, the gap not only in, in, in between chips, but it's also a gap in energy use and so on. You know, try, try to get a bit from DRAM into the computer chip, into the CPU chip, it takes a significant amount of energy. And try the amount of energy required for things like AI is horrendously more 
than uh, what has gone before. So energy use becomes extremely important and we need to take that into account and try to uh, mitigate for it. Um, so uh, there is a data explosion and AI drives the volume of the interchip data movements and that dramatic rise in energy use. And this is key. This is a negative externality. Um, for instance, training a single AI model can emit as much carbon dioxide as five cars in their lifetime. This is a paper. Um, let's see, it shouldn't be number one. It should be number, it's from Strubel. Energy and policy considerations for deep learning in, in natural language processing. So that should be number two. Uh, AI data centers are destined to, are predicted to consume greater than 10% of world energy capacity by 2025. This was from uh, uh, Gary Dickerson from Applied Materials, uh, taking you know, predictions from elsewhere. So energy, 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 energy. And it's, exa it's exactly, uh, 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 we need to take that into account. And as young engineers, you need to look to the future and see how can we mitigate for that? Things like um, new packaging technologies where we have separate uh, chips for the different types of uh, memory, but we have the ability to reduce the impedance between them, right? So, uh, you know, various types of uh, connections between the chips come into play specifically to reduce the capacitance of that line between the chips. And we'll go into that more in a bit. So what is a neg negative externality? Um, if, I, if I am a chemical company and I, I produce chemicals and sell chemicals to others, but the chemicals also produce pollution in the environment, the, the cost to those others who live in the environment that sees that extra pollution is a, is a negative externality. So a negative externality is a cost that is suffered by a third party as a consequence of an economic transaction. In a transaction, the producer and consumer are the first and second parties, and third parties include any individual organization, property owner, or resource that is indirectly affected. Externalities are also referred to as spillover effects, and a negative externality is also referred to as an external cost. So I want to apply that to the various types of memory that we've been looking at, um, because these negative externality costs are rising in importance. And, uh, uh, you know, the whole argument here is that uh, uh, that cost is not taken into account in uh, the cost per bit of, uh, of a memory uh, uh, chip. So, for example, um, negative externality one, memory endurance leading to a limited uh, SSD lifetime. And, and I want to talk about total cost of ownership, right? So if you look on the right hand side, you can see, uh, you know, I, I took some time to draw this in three dimensions, three dimensional uh, schematic representation of 3D NAND. And you can see there's the, the MOSFET, here's the, the gate all around uh, here, here's the, uh, the channel, silic, channel, channel polysilicon or nanocrystalline silicon. There's an oxide uh, stump in the middle and we store charge, we change the threshold voltage. But what has been found is that oh, we can store uh, uh, more bits electrically in each cell. So that's what the, the manufacturers have done. They've gone from, um, uh, you know, one bit per cell, uh, two bits per cell, all the way up to four bits per cell and beyond. But notice what happens to the cell endurance. This is at the cost of endurance. So um, we go from uh, 100,000 cycles or thereabouts for a one bit per cell, and we go down an order of magnitude to two bits per cell and so on. So, to, so what, the, uh, the, what is, has been decided is that uh, cell endurance can be given up uh, as long for um, uh, getting to higher densities, higher effective densities and lower costs per bit. Um, this data, uh, by the way, comes from Micron itself, right? Now, this is an interesting thing because Obviously, then a lot of uh, uh, um, management is done and a lot of marketing is done to say, well, the, the lower endurance numbers are good for uh, read many workloads, not for write many workloads. And then for the 
the ones with high endurance, um, greater cost per bit, then these are for right intensive workloads and, and so on. So there's this management of, of, of that effect, but this is the fundamental effect, the endurance going down uh, orders of magnitude as a function of increasing the, uh, uh, the number of electrical bits per cell. So when it comes to consumer applications, the key, the key uh, thing is the dollars per gigabyte. You know, how many dollars do I need to pay for one gigabyte? Um, and that is uh, what's called the hardware acquisition cost. And it's the, the, the number of gigabytes is proportional to the number of layers uh, 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 times the bits per cell in 3D9. So if I can increase electrically the bits per cell, I can effectively reduce the cost metric for consumer applications, but at the cost of cell endurance. Now, this is a legitimate thing to do because many, many uh, um, uh, consumers are not too worried about uh, endurance because they don't use the memory in that, in that way. But it turns out that I think Jim Handy made the, uh, made the point that in lockdown, uh, the number of write cycles to the NAND, to the SSDs has increased dramatically and failures have been seen. So this is pushing the envelope for this uh, acquisition cost. Now for enterprise applications, this is for businesses and so on. They're worried about how long does something last? So there the cost metric is the dollars per petabyte written. So how many times can I write to my SSD, you know, flush everything out, write again uh, uh, to it? How many times can I do it uh, over the lifetime before it, 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 it collapses? Um, so who are the, the main uh, buyers of that? Data centers and corporations. So that includes the endurance, the cell endurance. So petabytes written is basically the, the total capacity of uh, an equivalent SLC, SSD, times the bits per cell. Um, because we increase it, times uh, the cell endurance. So these two are heavily linked, times one over the, the right amplification factor, because NAND has this uh, nagging uh, problem that when you want to write once to it, it actually has to shuffle everything around. So effectively you write several times, but you don't see that, but the, the system sees it. So it has a right amplification factor. So petabytes written. Here's the cell endurance that comes into play. So that is important for these kind of applications. Um, so 3D NAND cell endurance, very strong function of the bits per cell. So you can see it there. Uh, the main factor now in 3D NAND is to increase the petabytes written by increasing the number of layers uh, and then segmenting the market into read intensive and write intensive. So when they say write intensive and read intensive, remember this plot here. This is the fundamental relationship between cell endurance and bits, electrical bits per cell. So two takeaways here, acquisition cost and, uh, and uh, um, um, uh, uh, total running cost. The total cost of ownership is acquisition plus cost plus uh, the, the total uh, uh, running cost of the device. So um, uh, endurance comes into play. Okay, so then limited endurance and consequences, the negative externality. Um, uh, things to remember about NAND, pass disturbs. Uh, um, uh, to reduce pass disturbs required the thick, uh, thick tunnel oxide. Um, Samsung discovered this in uh, between 2003 and 2006. So they discovered that if, if they take a simple classic Sonos device with an ONO for charge storage, such as down here, then they to avoid uh, tunnel mechanisms uh, or avoid read disturbs and pass disturbs, they would need to uh, uh, thicken up the tunnel oxide. Now that uh, thickening up of tunnel oxide meant that all the other layers thickened up too, and it co caused severe uh, uh, program erase cycling damage. So uh, classic Sonos could get to millions of cycles. Um, we actually, uh, published that as matrix in uh, 2003, but when you stick them into a, a string of, of NAND, uh, a NAND string, uh, you have to thicken up everything and you get limited endurance. So it's a the fundamentally limited endurance inherent to NAND compared to classic Sonos. And it's all to do with uh, managing the disturbed mechanisms. Um, uh, 
but there's also built-in product obsolescence. This is fundamental physics of the devices. Um, so the, the manufacturers have to use that, have to play with that. That's the, uh, the hand of cards that they have been given. So uh, th there's a built-in product obsolescence with that, shortened replacement cycles, which can lead to long-term sales. All of them are in the same boat. We've got an oligopoly of, of manufacturers now for NAND. Um, and they're all up against the same fundamental physics, up, all up against the same uh, problems with endurance. But there is an environmental impact in resources and energy use. So, for example, if you look on the right hand side, that is um, uh, uh, um, an SSD crusher. So you st once the SSD has reached its lifetime, uh, the end of its life, then it goes into something like that and it gets crushed into particles. So nobody can read the data. And then uh, there is some form of uh, 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 recycling, but basically that takes energy, that takes resources, all that, all those mil billions of dollars spent on fab, man fabs and production then end up in a heap of, of particles because of the limited endurance. So that's a negative externality. So this is a very interesting physics here. Uh, Non-string non requiring thickening up of the tunnel oxide. Thickening up of the tunnel oxide uh, ends up with uh, severe uh, cycling damage and that limits the endurance. Now the reason, so what can be done about this? The reason I'm, I harp on about this is because uh, I, I saw that in about 2004, 2005, and um, I started a company to build a different type of, of device. Uh, so it's basically, um, it wasn't a vertical channel device, but it's basically a dual gate transistor with channel polysilicon as the, as the uh, material for the channel. And then we have ONO on one side, we have a, a regular oxide on the other, we have a pass gate and a memory gate. So when we want to hook up these devices as a string, we can then store the charge on one side, but pass through on the other side without impacting the, the disturbed mechanisms on this side. So we can actually thin down the oxide again. We can get down to millions of cycles again. So I actually had uh, 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 endurance cycling of up to 10 million cycles with no change to the, the window of the, of the device. So, um, so this, is, this is still out there. Uh, it never made it into a product. Uh, um, it's been quite a long time, but we'll see what happens when, uh, you know, perhaps it will be made into uh, or accepted into the 3D NAND uh, string architectures where a small change in the, a not insignificant change in the process would be required to introduce such a concept. Then we have SST MRAM. So this I worked on uh, for the past three years. Um, and it turns out SST MRAM is uh, also fundamentally limited by, uh, by um, various factors, but uh, specifically endurance. Um, to be able to, um, to reliably uh, program the bit requires a large current. So to combine uh, uh, a good retention for non-volatile applications uh, requires a stiff magnet. To flip the magnet requires a, a big tunneling current. That big tunneling current damages the thin magnesium oxide tunnel dielectric. So we have this trade-off. We have to build good, uh, reliable uh, non-volatile memories, but they, they are limited in, in endurance because of the currents required. And that also limits the cell size. So there, uh, in the, comp the previous company I worked for, uh, they came up with a um, uh, uh, design solution, a design solution that could uh, monitor the behavior of the of the the unprogrammed bits and uh, treat them differently, and then reduce the the total um, uh, current required to flip the the population of devices, and therefore re, uh, increase the endurance by up to five orders of magnitude. So this was a a, a design solution, and it was the first time I had seen a design solution boost endurance by orders of magnitude. In, in charge storage devices, you can do it within an order of magnitude. But here was a, 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 an unusual application in STTM RAM. Now, there, it turned out it, it required energy and power dissipation to do that. So 
uh, you know, it, it didn't take off. Uh, but there was a, 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 an example of a design solution that could play with the endurance. So then DRAM row hammer. So I'm preaching to the choir here when I talk about DRAM row hammer. And I'm uh, greatly honored to have, uh, you know, been involved in this. Uh, this paper that uh, 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 two of my colleagues and I came up with was actually a work that kept us busy during uh, lockdown here in California. And it, uh, it took us months and it was a joy to work on because it introduced us to the marvelous work of, uh, of various groups, including uh, 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 Professor Mutlu's group and those from uh, Google and from Microsoft. So it was an honor to be able to, be, to uh, work on this and it kept us uh, sane during the lockdown here. Um, but anyway, it's a, it is a, um, a disturbed mechanism and it is a, a serious disturbed mechanism. Repeated access of a DRAM row causes bit flips in nearby rows. Uh, first public unmasking, ma unmasking in 2014. Google showed how to use Rohammer to hack into a laptop in 2015. Uh, newer node DRAM products are becoming more susceptible. Um, uh, all mitigations have been worked around except for the recent ones so far. So uh, we await uh, uh, the good natured hackers to get around that too. Uh, the effect is, is that from a physics perspective, it is extremely interesting. It is a combination of a bipolar effect, which is electron injection and capture uh, by the, uh, the storage node connected to the capacitor. And it is also a MOS effect, which is a crosstalk, which is uh, one gate, uh, you know, flip, uh, bouncing up and down in voltage causes the uh, adjacent ones to bounce up and down in voltage, which cause uh, uh, MOS conduction in the, the channel of the, of the disturbed bits, um, which allow char charge to leak out. So that combination is, uh, uh, is extre extremely interesting, actually, bipolar effect and a MOS effect. Now, the bipolar effect is interesting. If you look, if you look here, um, it turns out that uh, when, you, when you inject uh, charge from um, uh, one of the MOSFETs in the uh, um, in one one row, uh, these then these then get injected into the P well. So if you look here, here is a P well. Here's the MOSFET. Here's the MOSFET. So storage node bit line and storage node. So we get conduction. Um, we get injection from from uh, a, this device from traps, as it were. Electrons are traps. They get injected into the P-well. The P-well has a, cons a construction that involves what is called a retrograde well. That retrograde well provides a, a, a reflecting barrier, a reflecting energy barrier, which reflects the electrons. And that this reflection means that they get picked up. They tend to get picked up by storage nodes in the close vicinity, vicinity of the injection point. Now we can see that here the peak electron concentration as a function of distance from the injecting point, as a function of the type of doping of the, of the P-well. Here we have a uniform P-well. The electrons can travel very, very far. As we increase the doping, the retrograde doping of the P-well, the P-well acts as a lens. It bends the, the injected electrons and they get picked up by uh, the storage nodes adjacent to um, uh, you know, closely associated with the injection point. This effect actually goes back many, many years. It's used in uh, in um, applications like latch up prevention. There was a paper from the 1980s from a, a guy called Troutman, and there's also some nice work on uh, crosstalk reduction in uh, uh, fo uh, photosensitive detectors. Um, to prevent uh, electrons from uh, spilling over into another uh, into another node. So this is the physics is is fascinating. Um, what is also what is also important is that the cell capacitance reduces as we go down in the technology nodes. Now this has a major impact because um, every time we reduce the capacitance, the 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 value of each electron which is picked up increases uh, because it's proportional to one over the capacitance. So that is a major driver for the increase in uh, row hammer sensitivity. 
and must be taken into account. So the, the, the physics of row hammer is extremely interesting. It's a disturbed mechanism specific to DRAM uh, uh, and it's getting worse. So uh, we need to take that, we need to mitigate for that. It's extremely important. Things like um, mitigation involving refresh engineering. This is like a containment effect. How can we contain that effect? Uh, we need to shield for both the bipolar effect, the injected electrons, and the crosstalk effect. Um, so we need to uh, uh, we need to construct uh, uh, approaches. Um, so, for instance, here here we came up with a, a thought experiment. What would be what would be a good structure for for a DRAM architecture to to shield for uh, the bipolar injection and to shield for crosstalk? So. It turns out work was done a, over 30 years ago in the lab I used to work for. Uh, Fred von Oman used to be my boss in that lab. He worked on the creation of buried uh, silicide regions. Um, and you can actually create a silicide region, low ohmic silicide region with uh, monocrystalline silicon on top, monocrystalline silicon on bottom, and you can then use it as a buried metal bit line. Uh, recently, I worked uh, in um, with IMEC and with NASA on the creation of a vertical channel transistor. Uh, you can combine that. This is uh, like epitaxially grown, selective epitaxially grown uh, channel uh, and combine it with this idea and you can create a device where the storage node is no longer in the substrate or in the P-well, it is at the end of this device here. So uh, we get shielding from any injected electrons from other nodes. Uh, because of this uh, buried uh, bit line, and we get shielding because the storage node is not no longer in the in P well, and then to shield for um, uh, for crosstalk for the MOS effect, we can provide metal shielding. We have uh, ALD versions of metal depositions of thin layers, which we can pro uh, not easily. These are, none of these things are easy, but we can come up with ideas for these kinds of things. Now, the, the manufacturers obviously um, uh, want to continue their, uh, their um, uh, you know, uh, shrinking. These kinds of applications provide certain breaks in, or, uh, you know, um, uh, breaks in the, sh in the shrinking, slowing down of shrinking potentially. But crosstalk is becoming so uh, uh, onerous that uh, these kinds of things may appear in the near future. What is appearing uh, in uh, conference papers is 3D DRAM. Concepts about taking DRAM into the third dimension where we don't have to deal with a fancy capacitor um, and we can stack layers. So that would then uh, mitigate for, uh, of, for Rohammer to a large extent until we get the crosstalk effect again. Uh, you know, the shrinking of each layer, we get crosstalk again. So those, those are the kinds of things that come into play when we try to solve the bipolar effect and the MOS effect, uh, which are root causes of, uh, of Rohammer. Um, energy use and the problem with memory. Um, fetching and storing data in solid state memory uses uh, uh, greater than or equal to 60% of the system energy. This was a paper from Burumand et al at, at Google. Uh, and uh, uh, it uses uh, this fundamental knowledge, basically, of energy per operation as a function of the operation. If you look here, this is a paper from Pedram, from, uh, uh, from the group at Stanford. They looked at, uh, you know, the energy required to do a 16-bit multiply. This was less than one um, picojoule to do that. To access the 16 bits from uh, a 4K word SRAM on the same piece of silicon on the same chip required about an order of magnitude more energy. But then if you had to go off chip and you had to access those 16 bits from an off chip DRAM, you can see what happens. We're getting three orders of magnitude more energy used to get those bits from the DRAM across the, uh, uh, the interface, across the gap between the two chips into the, uh, the architecture, into the chip that contains the CPU. This is, uh, to me, is of fundamental importance to the, uh, to the use of memory, okay? Other things we've already dealt with, like static leakage effects, which are 
fundamental physics of the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the tunneling and also the uh, electrons and holes getting over the energy barrier at the source of a transistor. So this, this, this movement of data and the energy required to do that is of fundamental importance. Now, the physics of charging and discharging of capacitors. Now, for, a, for an engineer, this is simple physics, right? So half CV squared energy stored on a, on a capacitor and then, uh, you know, um, basically, uh, you know, trying to uh, uh, put more charge onto that capacitor requires more and more energy. So we're, we're storing all that energy. And then the, the capacitor is discharged. All the energy is dissipated, right? So those two things, but it turns out if you're a physicist, this is much more interesting than just uh, a half CV squared. Um, it, it turns out that um, uh, the energy uh, energy consideration in, in capacitors and storage of, of energy and getting the energy from, a, from fr uh, say from a, a battery to that capacitor is much more complex than just, you know, uh, uh, you know half CV squared. Where does the other half CV squared go, right? When you're when you've got CV squared in the in the battery and you're trying to store the, so you're losing energy. Even so, it turns out even for a system where you have superconducting uh, conductors with zero resistance, you have the same half CV squared stored and then half CV squared removed. So if you're interested, you should look at things like energy transfer in electrical circuits because. It turns out the energy transfer happens in the field outside the uh, outside the conductor, and then energy considerations in a two capacitor problem. There's a nice problem where you have one capacitor stored to a certain value with a certain amount of charge, and you suddenly uh, uh, hook it up to um, uh, another capacitor, and at the end of the day, you've lost half the half the energy in doing that. So. The physics of this is extremely interesting. The engineering aspects of this are extremely important for energy consideration. So what are the re what's the relevance to integrated circuits, systems, and AI? So any IC and system is an electrical power supply and a network of capacitors and resistors. That's all it is. Uh, data movements require charging and discharging of wires. The wires are capacitors with the capacitance proportional to the length of the wire to first order. Um, so there, there, then you come in, then you can understand uh, this plot here, right? This data is far away, far away from, uh, from the CPU, right? In, in, uh, uh, in distance in, uh, in wires um, and different types of wires, right? Wires on the chip, wires off chip. Um, energy conversion into heat and a bit of light is then proportional to the length of the wire to first order. Long wires between data in on-chip SRAM and processor, the longest wires are between data in off-chip DRAM and processor. Um, most energy conversion into heat takes place in data transactions with memory. So that is a fundamental rule of thumb. And here's where AI comes into play. AI needs extremely intensive store and recall between processor and memory. And the memory requirements pose a huge challenge in energy efficiency for deep learning models. So the amount of memory required for, for uh, learning and, uh, uh, and so on, um, inference and so on, is, uh, is, is growing. The ability for, for the uh, semiconductor industry to, uh, to follow that, to, to have memory as close as possible to the, art, to the CPUs, uh, is is there for not only performance reasons but energy reasons. So what? How can we make uh, the amount of uh, bits on the chip uh, as high as possible? Um, uh, uh, then we come up against the SRAM scaling challenge and so on. Then we come up against oh, can we put in a DRAM-like structure on the CPU architecture and so on? So these kinds of things come up, and AI pushes the envelope for that. So colossal energy demand. So uh, we've talked about this uh, before, but I want to emphasize this. This is uh, uh, a huge impact, potentially huge impact in the future. So the, the, the CPU interaction with memory, uh, this is uh, uh, an en energy consideration comes into play. What can we do about this uh, for AI? So things like domain specific 
specific architecture. So I'm not an expert in these areas, but from a physics perspective, energy perspective, I can see how these are important. Domain specific architectures for AI accelerator chips. Algorithms that minimize data flow interactions with off chip DRAM. Again, not just from a, a performance point of view, but from an energy and not just uh, um, uh, power dissipation, but total energy use is important. Package solutions that minimize interchip impedances, specifically capacitances. In memory compute, now you can understand, not just from a, the point of view, again, of, uh, of speed and performance and so on, but energy use. Uh, near memory compute, trying to increase the amount of memory as close as possible, metallically, if you like, to the, the CPUs. Um, principle of locality and time and space, cache structure and control, uh, data compression to minimize the weight populations, um, re so minimize the amount of memory required, reduce precision arithmetic. Can we, can we get away with you know, uh, defects in the data? Um, uh, maximize standalone main memory single chip capacity, have as much DRAM as, as close as possible to the CPU architecture. Minimize static energy loss, maximize on-chip memory capacity, and also fault tolerance and voltage manipulation. So this was, again, specific to MRAM, but it's also used in, has been used in Flash and SRAM. Groups in Stanford and Harvard are looking at that. Uh, but specifically for MRAM, we, we did this uh, study where we could reduce uh, the, the voltage required uh, to write the bit and then use a design uh, um, to increase the, uh, the, or actually in this case, reduce the voltage, uh, um, you know, to write the bit and make do with the, uh, with fault tolerance in AI uh, with the resulting population of bits that wouldn't write. So, um, so in summary, the, the cost per memory bit is becoming a weakened metric. Um, uh, it's directly associated with acquisition costs, right? Running cost and negative externalities, the ones that I have uh, uh, talked about are not really built in. Um, the, these negative externalities are becoming more important as scaling proceeds. Um, short product life cycles due to limited endurance, uh, wasted energy and resources. Uh, now, don't get me wrong, the, uh, to fix these things, to manage, the industry has been extremely good at managing these, uh, these externalities, right? But the externalities are like the tide, they keep on coming in and, and, and getting bigger. And what do we do about them? Um, computer insecurities affecting clouds, laptops, and mobile phones are one mitigation workaround away. Um, dramatic energy use increases uh, increases are driven by the data deluge and AI requirements. Can green energy keep up with the demand? Um, industry consolidation has led to uniformity in memory offerings, right? So it's it's basically become extremely expensive to, to get into the, uh, the memory space. You can't just come as I, I my own experiences is, is, is witness to that. Trying to come up with a, a new type of memory offering that can solve a problem in the memory hierarchy uh, and become uh, acceptable is extremely difficult. Even even if uh, even if it's uh, an extremely um, useful uh, approach, uh, not saying that I'm not trying to blow my own trumpet, but it's uh, uh, it's a, even with that, it's seen as a threat by the existing players in the mar marketplace because uh, they have so much to potentially lose. Um, so that consolidation has led to a uniformity and I would say a lack of thinking outside the box. And that's where many of the people listening and watching this will come in in the, in the hopefully the near future with their own ideas about how to uh, uh, you know, solve these challenges with interesting ideas. Um, so in, in the end, well nigh impossible to disrupt the main players unless... Uh, we have to see these challenges as opportunities, the entrepreneurial approach. What is the pain in the industry? These challenges are opportunities. Uh, energy and resource considerations will change the definition of a cost per memory bit. That's my prediction. To include a mix of process cost, die area, and the relevant negative externalities associated with the market. Now, how that's done, I don't know how. I don't know. Uh, uh, 
uh, you know, the 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 idea that uh, buying a DRAM and slotting it into a uh, into a, uh, a system has uh, a, uh, a negative externality uh, involved with the number of joules over the lifetime of you know energy dissipated or energy used in that architecture is uh, uh, you know very esoteric argument. So the idea here is to make it more well known. Uh, and uh, what kind of metrics do we need to use? How can those metrics be used to uh, to add into potentially the cost of the chip itself, right? To price that negative externality in. The memory hierarchy will open up from its closed shop position. That's what that's a hope. I, I think memory uh, uh, memory is a, a, an exciting area, technology and system wise, uh, design wise, you know, for uh, innovation. How can innovation be brought into play here from uh, not just from the player, the, the existing uh, 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 player, the big players? There will be room for technology innovation from non tier one players. Um, who will be the next Tesla of solid state memories? So I'm looking to you, uh, all you uh, uh, engineers and scientists involved in this space. What problems can you solve? What negative externalities can you mitigate for? Um, how can you use your fundamental physics understanding of what's going on to solve these problems for humanity? Okay, thank you. That's all I had. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much, Andy, for the uh, very nice talk, including a nice historical perspective uh, that you provided as well. I really enjoyed it. My pleasure. Uh, yeah, I actually agree with many, many things you have said over here. I think there's a lot of potential for uh, a big change in memory. And hopefully hopefully we will enable some big innovations in this space. Yes, uh, I'm sure, uh, I'm sure it will. Because it's, it, it affects the entire system, as you mentioned, right? And also the sustainability of the world, in my opinion, as you mentioned right. also, yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, maybe I'll start uh, the series of questions and then uh, Minesh and Girai also have some questions, I believe. Uh, and then any, anyone can chime in. It'd be good if people turn on their uh, cameras to ask the questions, of course, uh, when they do. So let me start with one thing. Uh, I mean, I have a lot of questions, of course. Uh, I'm happy to ask them as, as much as we have time. Uh, but one question uh, that comes to mind, I agree that cost per bit and this mentality around it has certainly limited uh, uh, the things that have been done in memory and also has caused these negative externalities, as you have said, and has limited innovation, right, uh, over time. Uh, and I, I agree that we need to overcome that. Uh, but immediately, uh, that uh, I think brings up a metrics or methodology or evaluation problem. Uh, cost per bit is easy to uh, quantify, right? And I think people uh, like these easily quantifiable metrics because they can do it easily. So what will be the metric uh, to evaluate the cost of the entire system, including these negative externalities? Can we even think about designing it? I understand part of this can be a research question, which is good. Uh, and also take into account the uh, long-term effects like uh, the sustainability, like the SSD crusher example that you uh, showed, which is, I think, uh, quite telling. So what, how, can we, how can we quantify, uh, how can we come up with a better metric? Yeah. Um I think that is a whole area of study, the, the policy study. How, how do you deal with this? Uh, looking at um, uh, other industries where negative externalities have arisen over time, how has uh, a government or how has a, a industry dealt with such things? So I don't, I, I don't know. I have ideas, but I think this is, like you said, a whole area for, for research in policy when it comes to semiconductors and memories. Um, and as you can, when you look and see what's happening with uh, the, the world, the industry, uh, industry, industry partitioning, and uh, also unfortunately how politics can come into play in this as well. You know, who are, the, who are the major manufacturers or who will be the major manufacturers in 20 years time? How can we, uh, as, as humanity deal with uh, the, the rise of these types of, of, of memories and their negative externalities. So I, I will admit, I don't, uh, cost per bit is a, a very simple engineering exercise with a spreadsheet. Uh, when it comes to things like energy use over time and uh, um, 
you know, those kinds of applications or or uh, pollution or uh, you know, crushing of 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 chips and what do we do with them? The cost associated with recycling and so on. How does the in, how do, does industry and government and humanity deal with that? That is for a next talk, and that will probably be for somebody uh, who is much better versed in in such things than I am. Um, but it needs to be looked at, in my opinion. So I I would I would open it up to the floor. I would say. What do others think about this? Is this is this something that uh, uh, you know better minds than than mine can deal with? Can can put forward uh, because the we need it. We need to figure out how to how to uh, deal with these things. Yeah, that makes sense to me. <laughs> if anybody has ideas, uh, people can of course jump in. This is like a- I think I think maybe for you. For the safari group, I think that would be an interesting area of, of research. You know the, uh, you know how to deal with negative externalities from policy point of view. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, I absolutely agree. I think it's good to uh, develop metrics, both scientific metrics as well as policy metrics that can help quantify uh, the entire cost of uh, engineering and policy decisions. Right. Uh, right. Yeah. Sure. Uh, I think uh, maybe if, if people have questions related to this, they can feel free to ask. I have one, uh, one uh, question related to this. You mentioned that uh, the, uh, maybe I'll, I'll t- uh, uh, I'm not sure maybe, uh, if I agree with what you said over here. The industry has been extremely good at managing the externalities. Uh, maybe in NAND flash space, <laughs> that may be true. But uh, for example, if you look at Rohammer or memory energy, uh, these issues are still uh, like Rohammer is still a vulnerability, right? It's yeah. people have been, uh, have been showing over and over that uh, these solutions that are purported to be Rohammer free are not Rohammer free. Right. And energy is clearly <laughs> not going in anywhere. It's yeah. Yeah. I think the Rohammer thing to me was uh, an eye opener. Uh, because when you look at the, you know, the fundamental physics of it is is very clear, right? When you look and see what where the electrons are going and so on. Mm-hmm. What was also interesting was that there was a, an opportunity for somebody like me to to publish such a paper because there was a, a gap in the market for such mm-hmm. things because it is basically dirty laundry for the for the manufacturers. No, but as as I've I have seen uh, in various uh, committees, nobody from the existing manufacturers really likes to talk about Rohammer. So it has been left to your group and to many of the other excellent groups across the the world to really poke at this. And I thought, oh, maybe there's an area of opportunity for me to look at the the, the, more fundamental aspects of it from a device perspective. So yes, it was an opportunity, but you're right. It is a serious concern and it's only getting worse. And I don't see, uh, solutions coming from the existing players. All I see is that uh, there is, oh, now we have reached a sub 50 nanometer uh, DRAM architectures. Okay, then the question is, what is the row, what's your row hammer count? What's your, how, you know, what, what is, the, you know, those kind of questions. And it's almost embarrassing to ask mm-hmm. because yeah. they don't have the, they don't like to come up with the answer. So, it, it's seen as, a, a, uh, in, I, I suspect they have hundreds of engineers working on, on such things, how to mitigate for it, but they'd rather not talk about it. So you're right. Uh, Rohammer is of serious concern. I think more so than any of the others uh, right now. Energy is, is obviously a great concern for the future, but Rohammer uh, is, is not being taken as far as I can see, I don't see anything from the manufacturers on that, mm-hmm. how to deal with that, except from the point of view of, you know, uh, more refresh or, uh, you know, standard mitigation techniques. And there's a, a nice nice paper from uh, Microsoft, I think, recently, mm-hmm. uh, Panopticon or something. I, I, I don't claim to understand it completely, but uh, mitigation t- for, for DRAM, but from the existing players, not much. And that, that is an eye opener to me. Yeah, yeah I, I, I agree with you. I, uh, I think this uh, may be a, a, an overall issue with the consolidation in industry and uh, the, the, pu- the huge push for cost per bit without really uh, regard for anything else. Uh, that yeah. mindset, uh, I think that's why I like your talk a lot also because 
it kind of gets into the mindset of uh, maybe perhaps these manufacturers, at least uh, from from an external perspective, we can as much as we can understand it. Yeah. It seems like if if they if they're if if the manufacturers are also participants in this research and they can help researchers, maybe we can find an overall solution to the problem right. much faster and much better, uh, and yeah. hopefully we can solve a more societal, let's say, problem rather than right. <laughs> Right now, one one yeah, hopefully, right. One thing there is, I know I, th this goes back to when I first entered the industry. When I started going to uh, uh, um, you know uh, conferences, I remember giving a paper in uh, Berlin at the uh, um, Esderp in 1989, September 1989, and uh, walking around Berlin, you know, the free time and finding oh look the the wall. And it, this was two months before the wall came down, right. And whenever anybody says, how long have you been in the silicon industry? I say, well, before the fall of communism, right? But uh, uh, um, anyway, so I, from an early time, I, I realized that conferences on silicon technology are a mix of uh, science, technology, engineering, and marketing. Mm -hmm. And as we have gone along, you know, 30 odd years later, marketing has become of extremely, of extreme importance. So, you know, how, where, what is our FinFed architecture? How can we get down to three nanometer? Or what's the DRAM market? We're sub 15 nanometer. It's very difficult to come up in that environment to come up with uh, ne negative statements, right? Because you feel, oh, you might be left out. But it's time, it's time to uh, uh, challenge the players on these kinds of things, challenge more and more. Uh, and hopefully, like, like your team does, uh, uh, work together with many of them to come up with solutions, and that that need is is uh, is just rising as we, as we go along. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Great. I don't want to occupy the whole question and answer session. Maybe I will uh, leave it to someone else to ask questions. Uh, does anybody want to? Does anybody else want to ask questions? Fantastic. I think uh, I'll. I'd like to ask a question actually. So um, I, first off, I'd like to say thank you for your talk. You know, you gave this wonderful history of, you know, placing all of this work in context of how it happened. And it's just great to see, you know, sort of an end-to-end -end overview of all of this. Um, so I have a couple of follow-up questions um, related to Rohammer, maybe following from owner's question even. So the first thing I'm curious about is sort of your opinion on, um, do, do you believe that Rohammer is sort of an issue that needs to be addressed for all systems that exist. Like, you know, if all, all DRM manufacturers should guarantee that their chips are free from this issue, or do you think it could be more of a system specific design concern, say for, you know, systems that particularly care about security issues or something like that? Yeah, probably the second, probably the latter, because, uh, you know, uh, it, it's, it, it's similar to the, um, uh, the NAND endurance question, right? Uh, I, I, you know, consumers may not be that concerned about certain aspects of security, whereas enterprises and government would be, right? So you can split it up like that. But but the problem with that is where do you draw the line, right? Who draws the line and where do you draw it? Um, you know, because you know, security for for uh, you know you and me is is becoming important too. I mean, the latest thing about hacking into, uh, into cell phones is, is, uh, is in the news today. Um, so, so I think you can segment the market that way, but the problem always with that is how do you do it and who does it, right? Because the, you know, obviously there's a, a vested interest for manufacturers to do it in a way that maximizes their, their profits, right? Um, and it might not be at the to the you know, for the best of 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 the consumer or the uh, the enterprise or government, but I think that practically speaking, that is how it will be done. But you can imagine the problems ari uh, arising from that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that that makes sense. So, as a sort of you know the next step to that question. Um, you mentioned, you know, that academia has proposed, I guess, several different mm. ways to tackle the issue in terms of mitigation mechanisms, whereas the manufacturers perhaps are tackling it more within their designs, right? So um, we see that, you know, at least in the academic works that we see, uh, 
there, there's a lot of different strategies for these defenses and they provide different trade-offs in terms of you know, overall system performance or energy consumption and so forth. Um, and it's not necessarily clear that one of these metrics is you know, the best metric for all systems. And um, we're, we're curious if you think that you know, whether this academic literature is approaching things from the right direction in terms of trying to optimize for one of these metrics um, or, or not, you know, if there's a better way to approach this general problem of what's the best way to mitigate this. And um, if, if you believe that, you know, it's not headed potentially in the right direction, how could it possibly be, be directed, you know, like right. pushing the research community? Yeah. Well, I think, uh, uh, you know, going back to what uh, Professor Mutlu said, I think the, the key is um, working together with the manufacturers, right, to, to really know, uh, you know, which, which approach works when. Um, because uh, being excluded from uh, the manufacturer, it's, it's a fundamental silicon issue, right? This di di uh, a disturbed mechanism that is only getting worse like this uh, is, is a, a responsibility of the silicon manufacturer then, and they need to do something about it. And I mean, that's after 36 years of being in silicon uh, process and device, you know, R&D and manufacturing, I say that. Uh, but the, like you said, there are many, many different types of solutions or mitigations to it uh, that you and your colleagues and, and many across the world are working on. Um, what is relevant, what is right, and when it can be applied should, can only be done with working with the silicon manufacturers. So there has to be a way to, to be able to break down that barrier, to, to, to have, um, you know, uh, 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 joint papers on 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 this with Micron, with uh, Samsung, with uh, 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 you know, uh, with the uh, with everybody who's working on DRAM. Um, it's the only way. So I would say uh, it's not just it's not really oh which one is uh, which one is important which one. It's all of the above, but it has to be done in conjunction with the manufacturers. So I that maybe. Um, you know, uh, the way that you have been doing it so far where you you publish the results, you're basically doing product engineering for the uh, and test engineering for the manufacturers in the public domain. And they have they have maybe seen this as, a, uh, you know, ho they hold their breath to see what Professor Mutlu's group comes up with next as regards characterization of their silicon. You know, they, uh, it, it has to go from them on one side, you on the other, to working together on, on solutions. Uh, uh, because then, uh, then I think that's the only way. The only way that, that, as if it's one company, as if it's, you know, the, you know this is what your silicon does, not this is how, how our silicon works, and this, these are the problems we need to solve. So I think uh, working in conjunction with them is the only way to do that. And to get to that point uh, is uh, an interest, interesting conundrum um, because you work with one, then the other may see that as a threat, right? So it has to be, a, it almost has to be uh, a consortium as happened with silicon technology where it became too expensive to come up with, uh, 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 you know, each company coming up with their own technology. You get these huge consortia where, uh, you know, all companies come together and each can then take away the solutions to, to their own fab. So there's almost like, this is calling out for a, a DRAM row hammer consortium uh, where there is academics, uh, there is, uh, um, uh, you know, manufacturers, they all work together to come up with solutions to this problem for, for, for the good of humanity, right? Um, so it's happened before and it can happen again. And maybe this is something for, um, uh, you know, for, like for a, a, you know, like an IMEC or, or something like that, where everybody comes together because this is not just a system architecture thing. This is a silicon problem that needs to be solved. Yeah, thank you for uh, that explanation. So uh, I, I just want to ask real quick as a, as a follow up to that. So you mentioned this concept of maybe this consortium. Um, do you believe that this will come about primarily from the manufacturer's initiative or from the, the side of, you know, maybe the researchers working to tackle this issue? Because there's, there's a lot of factors in the way that sort of yeah. prevent this from happening, right? Like secrecy and 
a lot yes. of things you mentioned in your talk. So I'm just curious yeah. about what you think. Yeah. Um, again, very interesting problem, right? That needs to be solved. Um, if I look at it, uh, I think it will take something like um, real, real uh, uh, raw hammer issues in industry, in the application, the use of DRAMs, uh, you know, a, a real, uh, secure, real security issues that come up in, um, uh, you know, in, in the use of these uh, DRAMs, when it's obvious to all that it is a raw hammer issue. Um, you know, taking down uh, 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 clouds, you know, whole clouds going down or loss of data to a third, you know, nefarious parties, which can be linked root cause to row hammer. I suspect uh, uh, with your groups, uh, you know, uh, bringing or, uh, you know, with the feet of the manufacturers, holding them to the fire, along with a certain uh, disasters, if you like, in, in the use of these DRAMs uh, that show it to be a row hammer issue. Those kinds of things will help the industry concentrate their minds on what needs to be done. Because up until now, it's been, uh, you know, the academic groups and some users of, e of DRAM showing what the problems are, and then the DRAM manufacturers remaining silent in public about, about the problems of row hammer. So I think it will, it, unfortunately, it may require uh, an incident or a series of incidents, real incidents that can be, uh, you know, uh, root cause down to a row hammer effect that will, will uh, concentrate the minds of, of those across the, the industry to come together to solve this problem. Fair enough. Thank you very much. I'll, I guess, hand it off to the next person who wants to ask questions. Thanks. Uh, maybe I can ask the next question, but uh, I first want to thank you for the talk and also for your recent papers where we can finally find uh, uh, some error mechanism, all the known error mechanisms in one place uh, causing raw hammer. So uh, my question is going a bit in detail about those error mechanisms. So uh, you also mentioned in this talk uh, two uh, key error mechanisms responsible for raw hammer. And uh, in my understanding, um, the characteristics of these mechanisms may vary with um, temperature or process technology or the design of the circuit. So my question would be, uh, which, uh, which of these error mechanisms do you think will be dominant uh, as the manufacturers continue shrinking uh, the memory chips in the future? And uh, yeah, what do you think about this? Yeah. <clears throat> Well, the main, um, the, if you look at the two mechanisms, the two main mechanisms, the bipolar effect and the crosstalk MOS effect, um, they, in my opinion, are, um, are uh, more, you know, the, the shaving off a nanometer here, shaving off a nanometer there probably doesn't change them that much. The construction of the, the P-well has an impact, but it tend, the physics is the same for everybody. All the all the main players. So these things are 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 they are the fundamental root causes. But the effect that exacerbates the whole thing is that uh, a diagram on the right hand side, which is this uh, this ever shrinking capacitance. So uh, this uh, you know the, the the manufacturers have to fit in a capacitor you know into the pitch of the cell. So they're they're trying to reduce that as much as possible. That has the, the major impact on row hammer with these, these uh, impacts being, uh, you know, being the, the, the causes of, of that effect. Um, uh, which one is, will be dominant? I think for, uh, we see obviously, um, I think the dominant one for the one, for the, 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 the rows right adjacent to the, uh, you know, to the, the hammered word, word line uh, is a crosstalk effect. And then the, the ones where, where you see this drop with distance are, are probably due to electron injection. So I think the dominant one, so you can split it up that way. The dominant one for uh, it, adjacent word lines is the, the MOS effect. And the ones for further afield are the electron injection. But the, the importance of both exa 
uh, is exacerbated by this uh, reduction in total capacity per cell. So uh, it's difficult to say. I think uh, that would be an interesting thing where uh, things like the effects of temperature on the various, because they have different uh, temperature impacts, uh, would be a great study if you could get in, into uh, uh, the manufacturers themselves. They have all that data. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, convinced that they have uh, all the data necessary to come up with a far better paper than I ever did because they have the real uh, data at the silicon level not just at the chip silicon level, but at the fundamental de uh, device interaction level. So that would be a great study to do, you know, and they, they probably have it, but are not allowed to publish. So I, I don't think that completely answers your question, but I think uh, the two mechanisms are there, but the main reason for their importance is the, the reduction in the capacitance per cell. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I, I think I got my answer. Uh, okay. I, if you don't mind, I have a follow-up answer uh, question uh, regarding this uh, electron injection model. So uh, in, in, in this analysis you have in, in this second plot in this uh, fee, uh, slide, uh, you show that uh, by using different uh, PVAL doping methods, uh, you actually are able to uh, contain the effect of Rohammer in a, a smaller area. Uh, me, uh, maybe we can call it blast radius here, right? Yeah. So, um, do, do you think uh, we can uh, reach a very small blast radius, like just like one row or zero rows, even going forward? You know, uh, by using this kind of methods, how how well can we utilize or uh, leverage this uh, PVAL doping kind of methods? to reduce the impact of raw hammer and just uh, make it uh, in a very small area. Right. So there is potential for that because you can imagine the, uh, if you look at the, um, the P-well structure, it's a, a retrograde P-well. So it has a higher uh, doping concentration in the depth than at the, set, at the, than at the surface. Um, uh, so you could, you could imagine uh, uh, you know, bringing that peak closer and closer to the field oxide edge here. And so to contain it even further. So you get reflection before it gets under the, before the electrons can get underneath um, uh, the field oxide. So you can, could contain it within a cell or two uh, here, but uh, there's an expense to pay. There's a, uh, a ex at, at the expense of uh, capacitance of, of a node. So uh, the ability, to, the, these nodes have to, uh, are you know, like the bit line uh, uh, store, the bit line node here will have then uh, a higher capacitance on the diffusion region with the P-well. So there would be a price to pay in speed and so on. But there is, there is uh, something to be said with, uh, for P-well engineering in relation to the, uh, the depth of the field oxide. You can imagine uh, having a technology where the field oxide is much deeper. So you can cut off uh, uh, electron uh, motion between cells that uh, that you know that are separated by uh, field oxide. So you can uh, get a deeper field oxide to, to uh, you know uh, as a wall to uh, electron motion laterally. So there's cer cer certain things that can be done here to do that. Um, uh, so yes, so there is there is engineering to be had to squeeze out that to make it more even more localized than it than it is right now. Yeah, at least from a, uh, at least from a you know from what I can see um, now. I suspect you know what the DRAM expert, the DRAM process device experts, probably have seen this. Uh, and are probably if it if it makes sense they're probably working on it. But you can imagine having a very very deep P well combining that with a very very uh, small pitch is is not insignificant amount of work, right? Uh, but it's almost like a three D architecture. But such architectures are, as you can see from three D NAND, well known. Um, so uh, being able to fill uh, a very very narrow trench, for example, with with oxide. I'll need to, I'll need to plug in. Hold on.
Okay, I'm back. Sorry, I lost. Are you still there? Uh, yes, we are here. So, okay. uh, yeah, thank you very much uh, for your answer. Uh, I think it's okay. very, uh, yeah, uh, it, it's very good. Um, but it, so, it does, it does, um, it does indicate the importance of being able to work, uh, you know, with with manufacturers, right? Because uh, those kinds of ideas, where the 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 effect goes all the way up to the system use of the of the of the memory, you know, are are clear. And uh, you know the, their importance is clear. I see. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, that's all my questions. Okay. I, I um, um, sorry. So I, I have another question um, related to this this paper that we've just been talking about. So in the theme of this paper in general, you're arguing that you know, having very detailed circuit level models is somehow not very accessible for people who aren't DRAM experts or you know, heavily involved in the industry. And having more accessible models would be very useful for, uh, I guess, these non-experts to you know, brainstorm and develop solutions. Um, so could you talk a little bit about what you feel is the ideal level of detail um, for these models that, that you envision? Um, yeah, so to, well, so in my experience, the, um, the, the circuit designer and the system designer in companies I've worked with have, have then been able to work together with the process device architects of the technology that's being used, right? Now, what's happened here, obviously, is there is extreme specialization, right? You've got a company doing specialized in coming out with BRAM. You've got the users of the DRAM who are, uh, you know, who are not involved in that uh, in that creation, and then you've got uh, companies, uh, you know, and academic uh, institutions who are looking at the susceptibilities of the use of such such uh, silicon. So uh, usually, if if it were a single company, if you were in the same company as the company that made the silicon, you would then be able to highlight which which portions of uh, the disturbed mechanisms are important for system use. So because of extreme specialization, uh, those at the silicon level probably don't see the importance of certain things. So they make certain uh, 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 decisions based on getting yield, getting silicon out which yields, but the yield doesn't take into account the, uh, you know, the disturbed mechanism as such. They probably have a single metric that says, oh, it gets past a certain number of row hammer cycles, so we're good enough. So being good enough at their level means that they can sell into a market. Um, but if it were one company, the, the, the ultimate product would be the system. Uh, and the system would have serious defects in reliability and security if this kind of mechanism were allowed to uh, propagate through from the silicon level all the way to the use of the at, uh, system level. So I think uh, the details of such things, um, you know, how this, how the mechanisms propagate through that food chain, as it were, uh, needs to go further than just uh, a row hammer count that is kept secret within the manufacturers. It has to go all the way up to the users of the, of the silicon, um, uh, as if they were all one company. Uh, so that 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 kind of model needs to be achieved in some sort of fashion. Um, you, as a uh, you know, as an analyst, uh, a data analyst, when it comes to the use of DRAM, uh, have to be able to go all the way down to well, we're seeing this effect. How what decisions were made in silicon architecture that amplify this effect, and what can be done, and that cycle has to be such that you get your input into the, the system architecture very early on, or sorry, the, the silicon architecture very early on, because those are the, the boundary conditions for uh, uh, architecting the silicon process. So the fact that users and analysts and academics and so on do not have a say in the architecture of the silicon uh, and the device uh, has a serious consequence, and that has to change. That in some form, that has to change. The importance of these mechanisms have to be taken into account by the silicon architects. Great. Thank you very much. That, that makes sense. 
maybe maybe I'll ask uh, a question related to this uh, in a sense. Uh, I think this is a very good discussion. Thanks. Uh, we've been, uh, you, you, you mentioned some potential device level solutions uh, to Rowhammer. Uh, I mean, and you mentioned that certainly they come at a cost, right? Uh, I'm, uh, I think these are quite interesting. Uh, I'm assuming also the manufacturers are thinking about potentially things like this, but uh, as you mentioned, they're not also, they're not writing about or talking about it for sure in public. Uh, what do you think about uh, memory controller based solutions? Uh, uh, I think there are quite a few proposals and even uh, early on, Intel implemented this PTRR mechanism, uh, which they turned off later because DM manufacturers said their DMs were Rohammer free, which turned out not to be true as you know the history. Yeah. Uh, but memory controller solutions uh, can potentially, let's say hide the problem, right? Uh, just like we do in Flash uh, today. Uh, and uh, I think there are many proposals like the one you mentioned from Microsoft. We had a proposal called Blockhammer. Uh, <laughs> who, uh, Girai, who asked you some questions, was the lead author on, which didn't require changes to the DRAM chips, for example. Uh, so what, how do you view those memory controller-based solutions? Well, I think they are similar. You know, it's like the sand disk of, uh, of DRAM, right? So mm -hmm. if you can come up with a control uh, system control that hides these mechanisms and really deals with them, that uh, nobody can hack around them, then, yeah, that's a way to deal with it. You know, the, there is, uh, uh, and then I'm sure the, the manufacturers would be really interested in, in having such solutions uh, applied because it would mean that uh, a great burden is taken off their shoulders. Um, so that's what led to the, uh, you know, the plethora of, 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 of the rise of NAND was, this, was the system view, or the controller view, how to deal with, uh, you know, these kinds of issues, challenges, problems in the silicon. So, uh, yeah, there, there's an analogy with NAND. And I think uh, it's, it's a good analogy and it's a powerful analogy and it can be made to work. Now, uh, what is the, uh, you know, the, the downside to that? What, what do you have to give up for that to work? Because... The, uh, the, in after so many years in silicon, uh, there is I've I've realized there's not only uh, Moore's law, but there's also the conservation of misery law, which says that you know uh, you solve one problem over here at what expense, right? So in in a company, if you can solve a problem and the problem then moves off into somebody else's uh, group, then you solved your problem, but the system approach hasn't been taken into account. So is there uh, the use of controllers? Can they be worked around? Can they be, uh, uh, you know, uh, do they take up too much energy and use? Uh, you know, those kinds of things have to be brought to bear. But yeah, it, there's an analogy with NAND, with SanDisk, with system architecture and controllers. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I, <laughs> certainly I, it makes sense to me. Uh, and maybe, uh, maybe it's time to rethink the interface to uh, the EAM as well, uh, since we have been... Uh, subject to this very rigid DDR type of yeah. interface, right? Which you cannot do really much with. It's, it's, it's limiting right. us in many, uh, in many ways, in my opinion. Yeah. Do you agree with that or? Right. Oh yeah. yeah. I think anything, you no, know, it hasn't cha changed that much because it's been so successful and the, the, the downsides have not been that important, but those downsides and negative externalities are coming up. Mm -hmm. So now it may be, be time to that and decide no we we need to make a change for these these reasons yeah sure. so okay that brings me to processing in memory uh what do you think uh, certainly there there's uh increasing interest in industry also this is an old topic from the late 1960s but uh, industry is finally picking up uh elements of it let's say there's the upmem startup uh, who have produced near data processing uh, engines inside the DRAM chip. And there's a Samsung who announced function in memory uh, DRAM more recently, built, essentially doing multiply and accumulate operations inside the DRAM. Uh, uh, what do you think of these uh, developments? And what do you, uh, do, you, do you think they will hold on or, uh, and we will uh, move, to a more, more, uh, move to a paradigm that's more data centric, that tries to reduce the data yeah. movement that you mentioned? Yeah, yeah. Or, or will, uh, Will these be efforts that will be forgotten in two or three years, let's say? No, I think, um, uh, I think that importance only rises with time, right? So that uh, the discussion about um, 
uh, data localization, as it were, how to, how to prevent uh, data movements is the crux to con the control of energy conversion, right? So I think they're only be going to become important because of that paradigm, because of that reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All data localization. It, 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 there's a lot to be said for that from, a, from an energy perspective. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. Any, any other questions? Uh, so, uh, hey. can, can, can you hear me? Uh, yes, yes, we can hear. Yes, yes I'm yes. sorry that I cannot turn on my camera for now, but yeah, I would like to ask you your opinion as an end of flash expert about the future of an end of flash memory. So before that, I would like to first thank you very much for the great talk that covers various aspects from history and fundamental physics to future directions of memory technologies. Uh, so I think that uh, major manufacturers keep continuously and successfully improving NAND flash memory-based storage devices in terms of both the capacity and performance, thanks to various advanced technologies such as 3D staking and high-performance IO interface, let's say. But as you mentioned, uh, NAND flash memory still has its inherent drawbacks compared to other emerging storage class memory technologies. So my two questions are, uh, how long do you think uh, that NAND flash memory can remain as the de facto standard for main storage devices? And what can researchers or engineers do for NAND flash memory uh, to keep its dominant position as a storage medium? Okay. Yeah, so um, it reminds me of, um, of a statement somebody uh, uh, more experienced than me made a few years ago. I said, what is the replacement for NAND? It, well, it will be NAND. So NAND, NAND, I think NAND is from a cost per bit perspective, uh, um, you know, an extremely successful uh, approach. Uh, there is not that, it's not obvious to me what could possibly uh, replace that. So what I think will happen is that, uh, you know, it becomes extremely difficult to stack anything on top of uh, what has been stacked before. But then attention will, will turn to, um, you know, uh, things like endurance. What kind of materials can we use instead of, uh, you know, charge storage in a nitride, silicon nitride material? What, what other things can we do? I just want to show actually the innovations involved in, um, in that. Hold on. Because this is, um, uh, this is it, it's, a, it's like the pinnacle of, uh, here, this one. This, this thing here, that, that, uh, that structure where you can see the, the, the gate dielectric consisting of all these different materials is, uh, is the, um, uh, the, you know, the result of many, many years of, uh, of innovation, how to optimize storage, uh, charge storage, and how to optimize at the same time, uh, so retention and endurance. So it's a materials play, material scientists involved in this, you know, and, and seeing what, what works to, to maximize, maximize the benefits. So I suspect what will happen with NAND is that there will be a, a, a eventually a leveling off of, uh, uh, of, of stacking, but work will then go into endurance. Um, what kind of uh, further enhancements can we make to this, this approach here? How, can we use a ferroelectric, for example, approach, which may have much higher endurance than, uh, you know, a high voltage uh, tunneling mechanism? Can we, uh, can we do things to that to optimize it for a NAND architecture with a vertical channel? So I think um, things like uh, maximizing the length of the string through, uh, you know, the, the optimization of the channel material, uh, maximizing the uh, uh, endurance, through the mechanism of changing the threshold voltage of the device, and not just by charge storage, but by uh, ferroelectricity ferro and so on. Those are the kinds of things that will, will be looked at and are probably being looked at right now. Um, so I think it's going to be that. I think from a, a physical perspective, uh, the ability to stack is going to level off. So then attention will gradually uh, become uh, much more focused on the ability to increase uh, endurance of the of the devices. 
Um, no, the, I don't see any uh, fundamental threat to NAND, the NAND architecture from any emerging technology at the moment. I think it will be a, a combination of like uh, uh, FE MOS with uh, a NAND architecture that could see uh, you know, a benefit in the future. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for the question, yeah. Maybe I'll take one question from the YouTube audience. Uh, there is one question that, uh, that, uh, that asked about the HBM high bandwidth memory even though we didn't discuss it by Eric Notham. Uh, is, uh, do you think HBM is a long-term alternative uh, or is it also a, is a short-term solution since it's still using DRAM? I guess what's your um, perspective on uh, <laughs> HBM? Yeah, so I think, um, uh, I think HBM is, uh, is obviously, the, the, the main driver for HBM is uh, performance, right? Uh, speed, latency, performance, and so on. Um, but what it also does is reduce the, the capacitance of the, the interconnects between the DRAM chip and the processor chip. So I think, again, now with the, uh, the rise of energy, uh, energy use being of uh, a boundary condition, as it were, I think HBM uh, becomes even more important and I think will be taken further with um, uh, you know, further reductions in impedance capacitance between the DRAM chip and, uh, and uh, the, the processor chip. So we have things like, uh, you know, chiplets and, and so on. So specialization in each of the different types of chiplet and reduction of capacitance and interconnects between the different uh, chiplets themselves. So I think HBM is uh, the, the concept of energy use energy conversion from uh, a useful form into heat uh, over the lifetime of the, of the product becomes even more important. So, uh, you know, engineering will be directed towards that optimization even more than it has been now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Uh, I have one question actually related to these uh, maybe emerging 3D technologies. You worked a lot on this mono monolithic uh, Flash 3D technologies, right? Yeah, uh, and you you also talked about AI accelerators. There's certainly 3D integration, which is quite interesting, and Flash has been very successful in that. Uh, but people are also working on uh, putting memory and logic in a 3D manner uh, going right. forward. But we also see, uh, let's say, uh, uh, revived efforts in wafer scale integration. Uh, people uh, have been talking about it a long time ago, but uh, we have now startups uh, actually producing wafer scale chips. What are your thoughts in these two directions? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, we, um, you know, things like Cerebras, right? The, um, mm -hmm. uh, the huge single chip device. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, I mean, very, very interesting, very powerful developments, right? Um, and I think uh, being uh, you know, designs that are uh, less sensitive to yield impacts, for example, are important and so on. So I think from the point of view of, uh, of again, speed uh, and energy use, they become also important, right? It's not just speed and uh, performance and so on, energy use, being able to keep the, the data local within the same silicon chip. I mean, the silicon chip is much bigger now, but I think it may be better to do it that way than going off chip to get, uh, uh, you know, DRAM data. Um, I think, uh, yes, this will drive even further along the lines of a, a reintroduction of the importance of on-chip DRAM solutions, right? Embedded DRAM solutions. And then also going further than that, on-chip DRAM kinds of solutions that are also part partially non-volatile. Mm -hmm. um, so a combination of that. So those kinds of efforts be, uh, will, I think, in my in my opinion, uh, gain more and more momentum because <clears throat> because of not just performance but because of uh, energy considerations. So I think yes, you're right. The, this uh, you know in, uh, integration onto a single chip, no matter how large, almost uh, if uh, you know because of energy considerations, not just because of speed and performance, will become important. Yeah, yeah, I, uh, I certainly agree. I think, uh, like in my classes, when I talk about uh, Cerebus's recent chip, I mentioned that uh, 
perhaps uh, this is a great example of minimizing data movement as long as yeah. you can effectively utilize the 40 gigabytes or so memory, yes, SRAM, SRAM memory that they have. Yes. If you yes. could include like embedded DRAM or some non-volatile technology that's much denser, you can certainly increase that capacity exactly. much more yeah. significantly yeah. inside yeah. the wafer, wafer scale chip. Uh, okay, great. Uh, I mean, I have some more questions, but uh, it's already been almost two hours. Uh, okay. I'm happy to discuss that further with you separately. Yeah, uh, yeah. Anybody, is, anybody uh, who has questions can contact me or, or whatever. You know? Sure, that's great. Yeah. 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 Uh, unless there, there's a burning question, then we can uh, try to end it here, uh, okay. if that's okay. Is there so a burning? I, send you, I can send uh, the, the presentation to you as well, uh, PowerPoint, if you like, and you can you know, for your own uh, benefit as well. Okay, that'd be great. If uh, That'd be great. We, we are happy to post it on our seminar's website, if, you're, if that's okay with you. That's fine uh, with me, yeah. Sure, yeah. yeah. And, and, and the talk is also already public anyway. Uh, okay. Uh, so yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll remind you if, you'd, if I don't receive it <laughs> at the right. end of the talk. Yeah. yeah. Okay, let me go once more. Are, any burning questions from anyone? Uh, yeah, hi. I would like to ask a question if okay. it's okay. I, I hope it's not. It's, it's okay with me. If, if it's okay with yeah, Andy, yeah, no, it's okay with fine. me. Okay. That's fine. Go ahead. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Andy, for the great presentation. I really enjoyed it. So um, I would like to ask this question in, in the context of non-volatile memories. And we see a lot of proposals in academia for non-volatile memories for processing in memory, right? However, yeah. we also see that the majority of these proposals rely on integrated CMOS digital logic to support different operations. How realistic do you think it is to integrate these different processes? Uh, is, it, is it possible or are, are there some kind of constraints that are only visible to the industry and not to the academia? Okay. Um, well, when I, when I started, I'll, t I'll tell you my experience, right? When I started the, in the industry, um, uh, uh, the industry had uh, basically integrated a PMOS with an NMOS to produce CMOS, right? And it was, uh, um, you know, for various reasons, uh, it was the the process. Uh, there was the SRAM cell came for free, but there were no new materials as such. It was all basic standard materials. Um, and then over the years, as the uh, as the, for various things, as importance rose, um, new materials came into play. So many of you know for the CMOS transistors, but then also for uh, embedded non volatile. Um, and the, so the importance was measured by things like, oh, uh, can I make a, a, a lucrative product if I embed a one-time programmable element into my CMOS process? But then what's happened over, over the years is that uh, fancier and fancier materials have been added to the CMOS process to get greater and greater functionality. So in the end, I would say if the if the, 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 the problem that is being solved is, is great enough, then the silicon architects can integrate anything onto a silicon chip. Um, so, uh, you know, so we see the problems that have arisen, such as energy uh, and endurance and, and those kind of limitations. So if, the, if the, 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 the solution is powerful enough, then it can be integrated into silicon. You know, uh, the, uh, the silicon architects are experts at things like, um, oh, how, what temperature budget is required to uh, to make this device? Will that change my CMOS transistors? What do I need to do to the transistors to allow that integration to take place? Is the new material, is it uh, uh, um, uh, defective to the silicon? Will it cause, uh, you know, problems to the, you know, those kind of solutions are dealt with on a daily basis. So I would say anything can be integrated into a silicon chip as long as the uh, the driving force is great enough, uh, and the driving forces th are things like, uh, you know, what's what problem does it solve? Is it great enough to to spend time and effort to do it? So I would say yes, these things can be integrated, and if it's a, a you know a, a memory type which allows for uh, a local data localization to such a degree that uh, um, you can save a lot of energy over the lifetime, lifetime of a product, then it is an argument to be made. Sure, thank you. Maybe maybe I'll ask one more question <laughs> if you don't mind, Andy. Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, if you can go back to that uh, slide where you show the mind the gap 
uh, twice. Oh, uh, uh, oh wait, 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 hold on. Yeah, I don't remember which slide. Maybe twenty or so. Uh, okay, hold on. I mean, you don't need the slide, but I think it's better. It's good to uh, look at it. Uh, yeah. Hold on. Did I do since I like it? Yeah, uh, here. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah, I like the slide certainly. Uh, I mean, there are many, uh, certainly multiple gaps here, energy gap, as you mentioned, uh, between the different memories. But one of the things that uh, ha does not get discussed a lot uh, is the latency to access memory. And uh, from the perspective of your talk, I see that uh, the long latencies between those gaps uh, lead to negative externalities in the system as well, right? Because we have such a long latency DRAM we make our systems very complex to tolerate those latencies, right? We employ yeah. a lot of architectural techniques, for example, and system software and software techniques uh, to overcome the impact of that latency on performance. And that comes at a cost, uh, both complexity, energy. And when those techniques don't work, actually, they waste a lot of energy and power right. as well. Uh, so I, uh, maybe this latency issue uh, does not arise uh, as, as, uh, as much as the endurance and uh, energy and uh, uh, and the raw hammer type of issues, but I, I believe it's very important as well. Yeah. Uh, maybe I, I'd like to get your thoughts on it, and I'd like to get your thoughts on like how can we bridge this gap uh, yeah. in latency uh, wherever I believe uh, they're at the points where you show the gap, uh, mind the gaps here. Yeah. So I think, uh, yeah, you're right. I mean, th th this is one of the drivers, not just from an energy perspective and performance, you know, speed, but latency, a reason for a uh, getting par part of this DRAM tier to uh, slop over into, the, into this chip up here. Mm -hmm. So there was an effort uh, years ago to uh, come up with embedded DRAM solutions, right? Mm -hmm. I think that will come back. Uh, but not just from large DRAM cells, but uh, DRAM cells which are efficient and allow data localization, further data localization here, and allow then uh, uh, you know uh, much faster latencies to arise within the computer system, and then the caching mechanism can can hide the rest of the the latency within the within this. So I think it it uh, uh, this interface becomes less sharp. There's a, uh, there's a, there will be an integration of embedded DRAM onto this, uh, precisely because of that, uh, you know, not just energy, not just per classic performance and speed, but latency as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, d embedding DRAM onto a, a, a logic chip is a is obviously an easier thing to do than doing NAND onto a uh, onto a logic chip. Sure. There was work I was involved in to to uh, um, propose that kind of thing using this, the technology I worked on uh, where you could stick, um, you know, that kind of uh, dual gate architecture into a, a logic chip. So the work was done to come up with processes to do that, but no, there was no real demand at the time to do that. Mm -hmm. But it is, you know, uh, yeah, uh, speed latency, uh, uh, power, um, energy, all, all are becoming much more important and i think then the uh the manufacturers will find again ways to optimize for for that for those things yeah okay great thanks uh i think there's one more question uh from the youtube audience uh, uh related to uh are there any developments uh concerning memory and graphene uh of any value uh, oh i suspect there are um, mm -hmm. um i've seen a, a few papers on that um, and a lot of interesting physics and, and uh, engineering going into that. I think it, uh, uh, you know, this uh, two-dimensional uh, uh, FETs basically with uh, graphene channels and so on. Um, the key bit, uh, eventually the question will be asked, uh, what, what problem uh, will be solved by such an effort? So I suspect uh, a lot of the work that it, a lot of the more fundamental device and, and, and uh, 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 materials work uh, will uh, gain traction faster if such a question is asked earlier. You know, so I like, for instance, if I have a, 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 a group working on graphene, I say, I, you know, I, I want to work on graphene, but I want to know 
uh, why this is important. You know, what particular negative externality will I be dealing with by, by working on this? So that is not only from the point of view of, uh, you know, the interest in the device, but also gaining traction within the industry earlier, you know, that, but from, from manufacturers. I think that that would help. What problem is being solved by such an effort? Yeah, that, that makes sense. I think the problem focused uh, development yeah. is certainly very helpful. I think. Okay. So I don't have any more questions. I think it will go one more round to see if anybody has questions. Anyone on Zoom? This is your last chance, I think, for today at least. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Andy, for uh, giving this nice talk and discussing with us these technology scaling issues. We look forward yeah. to interacting more and really appreciate your talk and okay. time. Yeah, it was a great pleasure. Thanks yeah. for inviting me. Yeah, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Yeah. Uh, okay, thanks. Bye-bye. Yeah, take care. Yeah, you too.